Today we'll do some clipping and some gluing as well as some spraying, some punching, some drilling and some milling. G'day guys, I'm Clayton and this is Workbench Hobbies. Thanks for joining me again today. Uh, some of you may have seen the beginner's guide I did a couple of weeks ago, but this video is going to outline the steps I took to build my Panzer 38T and some of the steps I took to improve it. I won't waste too much time going through the basic construction phase because most of you will be across the basics of building a model, but I will try and highlight some of the areas that I improved my model in the hope that you can get a little bit more out of your own modeling. So to start, the hull sections are all joined together. As you'd expect, being a Tamiya kit, everything fits pretty perfectly and a touch of extra thin holds everything together. The kit comes with a small piece of photo etch for the intake for the radiator, I believe it is. Uh, this is attached using a super glue. I use a VMS black super glue. The black is excellent because you can see exactly where you've applied the glue. Uh, sometimes the clear super glues can be a little bit hard to see where you've put it. And time to start assembling the running gear and here I'm trimming off the leaf spring assemblies. The seam lines on the parts meant that there was a little bit of tidy up required with the edge of a hobby blade. In reality, most of this part is going to be hidden behind wheels and tracks and things, but it's important to still stay on top of the mold lines and seams and try and make as tidy a model as you can. The leaf springs are now attached to the hull section. Unfortunately, this model can only be posed as if it were on flat ground. The suspension and wheels are not workable in this format. However, that's okay. That's gonna suit my purpose for this build. The swing arms for the wheels are now attached and just using a straight edge to check everything is sitting straight as it should be. Now the wheels are removed from the sprues. Seam lines and mold lines are removed using the edge of a blade. This is a quick and efficient way to remove that seam line. A quick and easy way to add a little bit of character and personality to your model is to bash the rubber sections of the road wheels up. In reality, these sections would have been chipped and scuffed and marked when they were driving along the road and just by using a hobby blade, it's very easy to take a few nicks and knocks out of the rubber parts of the wheels to make them look like they've seen a bit of action. And the return rollers for the tracks are now assembled. Now it's time to paint the wheels and I always find that pre-painting the wheels just speeds the process along and just makes things easier. And the quickest way I've found to pre-paint my wheels is just with a little touch of blue tack and a toothpick and each wheel is set up on its own toothpick ready for painting. The first step when painting the road wheels is to paint the rubber sections of the wheels. Now rubber is never black. Rubber is always a tone of grey or at least most of the time is a tone of grey so I'll be spraying the wheels using the German grey colour, which I know is potentially the colour that we're going to use on the model. But I'm planning on working with tones and shades and realistically, I'm probably not going to paint German grey or Panzer grey on my model. So I'm going to use that colour for the rubber sections of my wheels. And just watch how simple and easy painting wheels can be with the aid of a painting template. This is a Royal Model product. However, I believe there are others available. It's just a matter of finding the right size, right diameter hole to fit your wheel. 
and then masking it up and preparing the template for spraying. So we're now painting the wheel section of the wheel, not the rubber. So I'm going to use a mix of German grey and light sea grey. I want a little bit of contrast between the rubber part of the wheel and the actual wheel section. So I'm using a lightened version of the grey to achieve that. The template is as simple as this. Once it's been masked and you've selected the diameter hole that works for you, it's just a matter of holding the piece behind the template and spraying your color. And there you go. You can see a contrast. It's probably not as great a contrast as I was hoping for, but realistically, after these parts are weathered, we're not gonna be able to tell anyway. So I'm satisfied with where I'm at with this. And don't forget to spray the back of the wheel. I'd brush painted the lower section of the hull for a beginner's video, but I wanted to add a little bit of character on this model now. So with the base layer set and in place, I've now used this light and tone that I used on the wheels just to add some shading and highlights to this under section of the model. The best color that I have found to paint the rubber section on road wheels is black gray from Vallejo. And I probably should have used that to paint the road wheels, but I didn't, and it's not gonna matter. But here I'm painting the rubber sections of the return rollers in the black gray color. The road wheels are now all glued in place, ready for the track to be fitted. And it's important once all the wheels are attached to sit the model on a flat surface to make sure everything is even, nothing is going to rock in the model and all the parts are sitting as they should be. Now part of me hates that I do this but it saves me so much time and makes life so much easier. With the Lincoln length tracks I like to pre-paint the parts whilst they're on the sprues and I do this using a mix of black and red brown. That gives me a nice rusty, irony sort of a color. And all I'm doing here is just making sure that once we assemble all these parts, every piece is gonna have paint on it. It's never a good idea to try and glue painted pieces together because as the plastic melts, it will affect the paint and potentially cause you problems, but given these are the tracks of the model going on the wheels, we will be weathering it and we can probably get away with a little bit. So I do this pretty much every time, pre-paint my tracks just to speed the process up. Now apologies for anyone who saw the beginners video that I did a couple of weeks ago because there's a little bit of double up here, but I'm trying to offer you a little bit of new content. Lincoln length tracks, some people struggle with it. I don't understand it, it's so simple. Easiest way to assemble these things is put all your parts out on a flat surface, put them together, a little touch of glue, and assemble the bottom half of the track, or at least the part of the track that is going to start to roll back up over the return roll of the idler and the drive socket. You will then find that you have a window of opportunity where the glue is still soft enough and the parts are still soft enough that you will be able to manipulate the track around the rollers and get the shape you need. Then it's just a matter of seating the top section of the link and length tracks on the return rollers, making sure the sag is in the appropriate place and a small touch of glue will connect the parts and you will have a beautiful looking track. A touch of glue on the return rollers will ensure the track 
has visual weight will sit down on the part so it doesn't look like it's floating in the air that's really important so with the wheel assemblies and the track assemblies now complete you can see that beautiful visual sag and that that implied weight that the track has and if you look at reference images you can see what what I'm talking about it's perfect the other thing I noticed here was how damaged the rail guards were and I thought this would be a really great opportunity to add a little bit of character to the model so using a Dremel tool I took to the underside of the track rails trying to remove as much plastic as I could without going through all the way The Dremel tool was probably a little heavy handed, a little aggressive, so I fine tuned the removal, if you like, or the shaving down of the part using a sharp hobby blade and just scraping it over the surface. Focusing on the front and the back sections of the rail and along the whole outside edge of the rail, just to thin the part down to make it look like it was a little more in scale. And then by using a pair of pliers, I was able to bend and twist the fenders, track guards, and make it look like damaged sheet metal. It's a really simple, easy way to improve your armor models, and it just shows you don't have to go to the expense of photo etch track guards for your models. It is easy to achieve a great look using the part that comes in the kit. The track guards are now glued in place and the shape of the underside of the tank is really starting to come together and look like a Panzer 38. Next up are the machine guns. Now the Panzer 38T, or at least the one I'm building, has two machine guns. There's one in the turret and one that the radio operator would use. Now the quickest way to add a little bit of detail to this part is with a micro drill just drill the tip of the barrel out and it will give you that little bit of extra detail that doesn't come in the kit it's a really quick and simple way to improve your models the armor plate for the driver and the radio operator is now assembled uh, the machine gun is on a ball mount and if you're careful with the way you apply the glue the machine gun should be movable I decided to pose the vision hatches open just for a little bit of interest on the model. In reality there should be a couple of elliptical hatches on these parts but I hadn't got my head around how to scratch build those just yet so I've left it off and I may come back to that later. The part is attached to the front section of the model and whilst I'm assembling machine guns and drilling out barrels and things. I've begun assembly on the front plate of the turret and again this is a ball mounted machine gun and with a little bit of care it will still be movable. The 38T's main armament was the 37mm Skoda A7 gun uh, and they carried 90 rounds of ammunition I believe. And assembly has begun for this gun, for this model. A little bit of movement is still available in this part because we're using a poly cap that came with the kit, which is a little small black ring. The optics for the gun are now attached and realistically, there's not a heck of a lot of detail on this part. Assembly for the rest of the turret is very straightforward. Just a matter of attaching the sides and the rear. Given the lack of detail on the interior of this kit, I'm not really sure how much of this is gonna be seen, but as a little bit of an insurance policy, I would always paint the interiors of my models, even if it's just in a basic way. So here I'm painting the interior sections in a flat white. 
and to just add a little bit of character and a little bit of that visual depth so it doesn't look like a stark white I'm doing some post shading using a heavily thin mix of red brown and black and I use isopropyl alcohol to thin that down it just seems to give me that little bit of extra control it's just going to give this part and this section a little bit of character and if for some reason we can see through that hatch we're at least looking at something that's got a little bit of character not just a stark white piece the machine gun and the parts for the main gun are now painted just brush painted using Vallejo acrylics black gray for the gun pure black for the eyepiece Again, most of this is not going to be seen. This is literally just an insurance policy in case the viewer can catch a glimpse through the hatch. The mantlet for the gun is now assembled in the turret and a touch of glue helps hold everything in place. The parts for the commander's cupola are now attached. I was actually surprised at how Tamiya went about this assembly although I guess given that they're all rounded sections and some of the parts will have the periscope detail I guess that makes sense the sections with the periscopes on them or the the vision ports if you like were pre-painted using Vallejo acrylics and they are now set in place to form the commander's cupola top of the cupola is now glued in place and the commander's periscope is set in place I often skip steps and don't follow the instructions and I find that sub assemblies getting through as many sub assemblies as I can really helps with me being efficient with my model building so that's exactly what I've done right here a little trick to add a little bit of life to your exhaust is once I've cleaned the part and we've hidden the seams is just stipple a bit of Tamiya Extra Thin onto the part and then using an old brush stipple away. This is just going to create a little bit of texture. It's going to give us the look of the burnt metal that we want for our exhaust. Work in small sections at a time because the glue will dry quickly. So small sections, working quickly, stippling with the brush and you can get some really authentic, quick, interesting results using this technique. The jerry can assemblies were together and the parts have a molded strap holding them into the bracket of the model. Now there was a big gap in that molded strap. So rather than try to fill it and sand it and muck about with that, I used strands of masking tape to bridge the gap. And just by using a nice sharp hobby blade, I was able to trim them close. In reality, these straps were made of leather. So the textures and the look of the masking tape will I'm hoping work perfectly well once they have a layer of paint. All of the sub assemblies are now attached to the model. And as you can see, they're all there ready to go. We don't need to muck about, glue them on, keep the model moving. Model building for me is all about being efficient, keeping things moving. I find I don't lose momentum and I keep my mojo high. And the hatch for the radio operator is now set in place. I find it odd the radio operator got a hatch of his own, but the poor old driver didn't. The tow hooks are now attached and the bracket for the spare track lengths is attached. And of course, I'd pre-painted the spare tracks earlier. So it was just a matter of popping them in the piece and gluing it all together.
some of the smaller pieces are now attached to the track guards. We have the no tech light, the rear vision mirror, toolboxes, tools, the jack block, as well as the tow points and the exhaust. Although I'd noted on a lot of reference photos, the Panzer 38 didn't always have the jack mounted off the back of the engine deck. However, I thought it was a really interesting detail, so I decided I was going to include it in mine. It's just an interesting part that can be a feature of the model and just add that little bit of visual interest. I decided to do something a little bit different on the left hand side of the tank and rather than just mount the jerry can with its straps sitting in its bracket I thought I would scratch build it a little bit and make it look like the bracket and the jerry can had been removed from that part of the tank so an interesting detail to add to this I thought was going to be a couple of little uh, bolts on the section. I made the bolts by punching one mil styrene using my hexagonal punch and die set and then to make the bolt that sat through I used my round punch and die with a sheet of styrene also. The styrene is easily set in place using a little bit of Tamiya Extra Thin as it binds beautifully to the plastic and whilst it's not a huge detail it's a little bit of detail that's just going to add some visual interest and just something a little bit different to the model. And with everything set in place, it's looking pretty good. And the turret is movable and connects. And the hatch for the commander is loosely fitted as I'm not sure if I'm going to have a figure in there or not but I'll give myself the option so I'll hold that in place with a small piece of blue tack and just like that the model is ready for paint or was it up at Oz Armor Fest they had a Panzer 38 up there and I noticed in this reference photo as you can see there were small marks on the turret I, I don't know if that came from the casting process or some sort of grinding process but I thought it might be interesting to add that to my model so rather than be content with what I had I thought I'd make a little bit more work for myself so I took the Dremel tool and started to add that detail to the turret section now I did practice this on a sacrificial model and I was really happy with how it looked but for some reason I was a little more heavy handed than I was on the practice model or perhaps this plastic was a little bit softer I'm not sure. So yes far too heavy handed but what am I going to do? It's going to be a little bit of extra detail on the model. So after I'd finished butchering the part with the Dremel, uh, just a light touch of Tamiya Extra Thin just softened the effect a little bit. And I think we're sort of getting in the right direction, giving me kind of what I thought it was going to be. Although it's heavy handed, it is no doubt a little bit of visual interest to the model. With the construction phase complete, it was now time to prime the model. Now, because I had pre-painted the wheels and the tracks, I don't want to prime these sections. So I need to protect them. So that was pretty easily done just using a thick band of masking tape, running it around the track section, rolling it around the wheels and tucking it over. Priming is done using Mr. Surfacer 1000. Whilst this is a rattle can, I actually decant the primer and shoot it through my airbrush because it gives me greater control with the volume of paint that's going down and means that I won't get flooding in areas. Uh, I will do a video on um, how I decant the Mr. Surfacer because I think it's worth knowing. 
uh, but I love the way this sits on the plastic. I love how it bites. I love how it binds. And there's nothing quite like the look of a primed model. So I carefully work around the model, build the paint up in sections. You're far better off to do two or three very like light coats than just try and flood the surface and get things over and done with. It will bind better. It will be smoother, which is exactly what you want. You want to set the foundations for the color that's going to follow. And with the turret primed, I now move on to the lower section of the tank, being careful not to get too much over spray through some of those gaps in the maskers web that, that I've set for the, the wheels and the tracks. Priming the model just means it's going to unify the surfaces, any blemishes, any gaps, any scratches, any marks instantly will be highlighted once you prime start priming your model uh, it will also mean that by priming the small little piece of photo etch that was on the rear deck there that the model will now be in a state to take paint paint doesn't like binding to metal too much so a primer will help with the subsequent layers of paint that we're going to apply and with the priming done i am going to call this part of the video done it's all primed ready for painting and like i said there's just something cool about a primed model i don't know what it is it just looks so clean and just ready for paint so i'm really looking forward to the next stage of this build please be sure to check it out i'm planning on posting it in about two or three weeks we're getting close and remember stick around at the end of this video i have some historical footage of this incredible little tank. Thanks for watching, I appreciate. Please remember, subscribe to the channel, give us a like if you liked it, please leave your comments. Uh, I'm new to this, so any help, any feedback is greatly appreciated. Thanks again for watching.